So I'm going to tell you what Comet is, if you don't know what Comet is. Um, this is just some, a result of some work I was doing to try and get uh, um, to synchronize editing diagrams in the web browser so that you can see what I'm doing and I can see what you're doing on the same diagram at the same time. Um, and for reasons that I won't bother going into in a great deal of detail, I have a lot of back-end code written in Ruby, so I didn't want to jump to Node or some of the other things that better support some of the more modern protocols. <coughs> so one of the things you might want to do this for is the publishing content. Facebook uses that to do this sort of thing. You know, pushing stuff into a web browser when something happens on somewhere else on the web and they want to push something into your page that you're already looking at, that's what they're doing. Chat, you'll see this chat client. I didn't write this, but you'll see it running later on. Um, so you can have the same chat client open in different web pages on different people's computers. People can join, they can chat, they can talk, they can see what other people are saying, they can leave, blah, blah. Um, pretty straightforward stuff. But uh, you've seen it, right? You've seen it used. Uh, and you may have actually tried to implement it or wish you could implement it without too much fiddling around. And um, if you've got an existing Ruby app, there's reasons why it's difficult to do, and I've, I've worked around some of those difficulties. Um, this is um, a snapshot of my application, the <coughs> diagrams. Um, I would have liked to actually have this show this live tonight, um, but it's not quite ready to do the collaborative stuff yet, so um, I'm not going to show it to you. <coughs> but essentially, that's um, that's just a, 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 a semantic model diagram um, on multiple tabs, one of diagrams, and that can be being viewed by someone else on another part of the web, and we can be talking on Skype and figuring out what we want things to do. And, the server's figuring out who's doing what and what it all means and synchronising the different um, displays, different presentations. <coughs> um, so, the techniques for doing this kind of um, browser or server push, pushing messages from the server to the client, uh, running a, a timer in the client and getting it to just do an AJAX call, if there's anything new, every so often. If you want a lot of clients, that's a lot of requests. You know, if you're going to poll every 30 seconds, and you've got a thousand or ten thousand clients calling, it's a lot of hits to find nothing's happened. Um, and <coughs> each of those hits has, a, has an overhead. Uh, Ajax long polling is the technique I've, I've used. Uh, the, the, the idea of long polling is that the browser says hello and the server says nothing at all until it's got something to say or until the connection times out and then the client says, oh, timed out, better ask again. So long polling is where the server basically doesn't respond to the poll, but it holds the connection open. And then at some, at some time later, when it's got a result to give you, it can give it to you instantly as a, as a return to that connection that was held open. So that's what long polling is, and there's reasons why it's hard to do with existing Ruby frameworks. And um, uh, there's ways around them. Um, if you can use flash sockets and web sockets, that's fine. But um, so with AJAX polling, you get quite a large latency. You've got to increase the latency as you get more users connected, because otherwise you get too many hits coming in, overloading your your infrastructure. With long polling, it works with most standard HTTP server infrastructures. It'll work through proxies. It works with most browsers. You don't need to worry about whether there's web sockets in this browser or not, or whether they've got the right version of Flash loaded. Um, but RAP is a little bit difficult and I'll show you how to make it work with that. The thing with flash sockets and web sockets is you get quite low latency in both directions if you're prepared to put in the server infrastructure to serve those long connections. You really can't do it with standard HTTP servers. Um, they won't get through all proxies. So there's various configuration issues. Some of the, some of the web sockets versions have security issues in them. So this is the way of the future but when the issue is sorted out, I'll jump to them. But in the meantime, <laughs> um, for what I need, I don't have really tight synchronization requirements. The long polling is working well for me. So with the RAC API, basically a RAC application has to support really just one API, which is call. And um, the request is passed in as part of the environment to the call. And when it's got a response, it can return a three-part thing, which is the status code, you know, 404 or 200 or whatever. Um, a hash containing some headers, which is part of the HTTP response. 
and a body object. Now the body object can be just a string or it can be uh, something that responds to each <coughs> which can then return multiple parts and potentially in a, in a threaded environment each can be done each can actually, the call to the enumerator can actually block the thread um, and uh, return a part and then later on return another part and later on return another part so you could use this kind of stuff as long as your server infrastructure doesn't mind having the thread kept alive for that, that duration. So bottom line is that Rack API really only supports a single request per call and apart from the innumerable bodies you don't get the response, you don't get the ability to return more than one response. And the other thing is that the thread that calls the Rack's applica Rack application's call method is basically blocked until you return. And so in an Apache situation where threads are quite heavy um, or passenger in general actually, um, you call into um, the, if you want to do long polling, you're tying up a server thread, which is a heavyweight thing and there's only a very limited number of them. Essentially you're tying up a whole Apache worker to do, um, to do nothing while maybe something will come, come around and stuff to happen later on. So it doesn't work terribly well in, in um, some of the web infrastructures. Um, Rack's not really compatible with WebSockets because it is just single, single request response. And the other thing is that if you're using SSL, there's an SSL um, key signing authentication thing happening on every single request, and that's quite heavyweight computationally. So um, that's kind of, you know, the Rack API was awesome in that it, in that it made it possible to, to mix and match um, servers with frameworks, but it does have this downside that it's really not architected for long-running connections and multiple uh, multiple requests and multiple responses per connection. Uh, and I think that's going to have to give at some point. Maybe socket.io is the right answer to that and using web sockets. But. So uh, I just want to show you a timeline of um, a couple of clients talking using long polling to a server. You, uh, The client loads a page or at some point it decides it wants to connect uh, or it wants to make, avail make itself available to receive pushed messages from a server. In my instance, it's uh, on a page load, but it can be at a later time. And it, send, it, it calls the server. The server does a little bit of compute here in the, the little red bubble there. And that, that connection, that socket then is held open, but it's not part of the server's compute line. It's kind of a socket the server holds open, but it's a lightweight thing. Um, hello. And um, another client will connect and do the same sort of thing. And uh, you notice I put a shorter timeline on it because now my first client's going to have some do some event which causes something some event that's going to be published. So in other words, it sends a Facebook update or it sends a, a diagram, you know, this object was moved or something. And that results in a normal uh, a normal H XHI um, Ajax call with a response. But in addition to that it wakes up this this thread and, re and, and emits a body back on the on the connection that was held open. So yet you have this this pole, which was server saying nothing. Suddenly, um, something triggers it to say something, and it returns from that. And so both the um, requester that sent the request in gets their response, but also anyone else that's interested in or subscribed to listen to that, <coughs> or, you know, to which that at that information is relevant, gets a response from their long pole, which is active at that time. The next thing it needs to do is reconnect because obviously it can't be told anything while it's not connected. So the server in this time, if anything gets published that has to come to this client in this duration, has to know that that client's probably going to reconnect and therefore we should put the messages aside for it so that it can get them. So the server infrastructure for this stuff has got to make sure it doesn't lose messages by knowing who's connected even if they haven't got an active poll and queuing, queuing those messages up so they can be sent when they reconnect. So supposing another another response uh, request response happened in here, as soon as this client polls, that's going to get returned um, immediately. Um, so there's a, num a number of timing issues. That's why I've drawn these lines on the slant because uh, you've got to consider what happens in in the window between the request being sent and the request arriving. And, um, I'll talk a bit more about that. So now client two initiates a user event and that causes a this long pole from here to be 